My biggest goal in life is to get a, an F-150 Lightning, which is the electric F-150. I drive an F-150, but it's not a Lightning. They are just much more fun to drive than a gas vehicle or a diesel vehicle. I haven't been able to buy one, but it's, my next vehicle will definitely be an EV. And they're hard to get, right? They can't make enough of them. As America races towards decarbonization, major vehicle manufacturers are in the lead, with GM's plan to go fully electric by 2035 and Ford not far behind. But the road to the future has some hairpin turns and rough terrain. We want to decrease the cost of transportation. Batteries are expensive and they don't have great energy density. To support a, an 80,000 pound tractor trailer, the weight of that battery is significant. Load up a tractor trailer with heavy batteries? That cuts into how much freight they can carry which means lower revenue and a slower supply chain. Where will we get the materials? Most lithium-ion batteries with higher energy density use cobalt, use nickel. Minerals that are mined overseas. In many areas of the world where that's not where we should really be spending our money. The main barriers to adoption, at least for consumers, is the range anxiety. As Americans, where we're driving internal combustion engines, we're just kind of used to having that whole gas station mentality, right? You say, oh, I'm going from here to Toledo, right? You don't worry about where your gas stations are, but when you stop and put gas in, it'll take you five or 10 minutes. You stop and charge your battery, even with a DC fast charger, it's probably gonna take you something on the order of, you know, 30 to 45 minutes to charge that battery. Who would wanna do that? Nobody. So somebody got an idea. Ubiquitous charging. You don't need to stop and charge your battery. You're gonna drive down the road and the road's gonna do it for you. Freedom to drive your electric vehicle anywhere you want in the US without having to worry about finding somewhere to charge it. Our goal is to actually send power from a roadway to the vehicle. You remember those little cars we played with as kids? Plugged them into the wall and then you had a trigger and the electricity would propel those cars around the track. Today we're trying to do that same thing. So it's not science fiction? It does seem like science fiction. And to be able to tell them that we've had a bus traveling around the track for six plus years at Utah State charging, they find it amazing. You can do anything if you get the right group of people together, you get the right ideas, you get the funding. And that is part of what we're doing at Aspire. What does Aspire stand for? That's a great question. Uh, Aspire is an acronym. Oh, don't ask me what the acronym stands for. It'll have electricity in it. Aspire. It stands for Advancing Sustainability Through Powered Infrastructure for Roadway Electrification. Headquartered at Utah State and funded by the National Science Foundation, Aspire is a group of five universities, four in the U.S., one in New Zealand, working together to reduce CO2 emissions, improve air quality, and ensure the transition to electrified transportation is equitable and accessible for all. Well, this is uh, our test bed for uh, electrified roadways. Here at the base is uh, a transmitter that's put into the pavement and its uh, goal is to send energy to an underside of a vehicle, what would be placed there to receive that energy. Okay, so this would be in the vehicle in addition to a probably smaller battery, Yeah, right? really the purpose of the battery is to get you onto the roadway and get you off. You can envision this in the pavement and then asphalt or concrete placed on top of it. It's all invisible. It's all invisible. <laughs> Crazy. That's the beauty of it. It's all through electromagnetic fields. If you have a cell phone and you place it on a charger, there is what's called magnetic fields that are coming up from the charger into that phone that is charging the phone. We're doing something similar. The only thing that's different is the power levels are higher and you're going out across a large distance from the roadway to the vehicle. So you're gonna be the vehicle and I'm gonna be the group that forms the, the electrified roadway. Am I gonna get a degree after today? Yes. <laughs> so I have this coil and I'm gonna put it in the pavement. Now, you have to accept energy in your vehicle from the pavement. So that's your purpose here is you drive on top. You wanna to drive more straight than that probably <laughs> is you have a lot of distance between these two Coils, and that makes it very difficult. To overcome that distance, you have to generate very high frequency currents or electron movement in these coils. And that's the purpose of these components here. Wow, so we've really set ourselves up for a complicated solution, Th right? This is a simple solution. There's complicated parts of it and that we leave to the vehicle manufacturers. We are working quite closely with Cummins. 
which is uh, headquartered here in Indiana. They actually have a couple of electric tractors that they've built already. Most people would know Cummins by the name of Cummins Diesel. They, they design and build diesel engines for big rigs, agricultural tractors, you know, big diesel engines. And so it is significant that they are actually in the electric space now, right? They see that that is the future. Cummins is interested in developing the products that the customers want. And what do they want? What do the regulators want? Cost-effective, economical, carbon-neutral vehicle powertrains. That's not going to be an easy task. They are working with actually Utah State University in a Department of Energy. That truck that's been driving around a wireless charging track for six years? That's a Cummins prototype. This project is going to use 500 kilowatt wireless charging, so pretty high power, on a Class A battery electric truck with a pretty small battery. Battery electric trucks usually, they might drive six or eight hours, they have to get charged overnight. But in this case, because we have the high power wireless charging, we're gonna be able to run the trucks 20 hours a day. This would have huge implications for public health in shipping corridors like Interstate 710 running through Long Beach, where high levels of pollution have been linked to a higher percentage of asthma, heart disease, chronic bronchitis, and cancer. If you think about all of these areas across our country where you have just heavy traffic going by. The majority of the people that live along those highways can't afford to live somewhere else. And healthcare costs only compound that. But if we trade in diesel for electric, we could clean up the air, save money, and save lives. Diesel fuel, you can store so much energy. On a long haul truck, you have maybe 200 gallons of, of fuel on board you can drive 12, 1400 miles. Battery electric would be very, very difficult to do that. And this is where the dynamic wireless charging that Purdue's working on, maybe that's a way to get battery electric long haul trucks. If this project is successful and deployed on a wide scale, it revolutionizes the way that we move people and move goods across the country. People expect to see these technologies really accelerate in more, let's say, uh, progressive states like California, where they have a lot of progressive policies, a lot of environmental standards. But it's happening in Indiana. And it really dates back to 2017, when our General Assembly uh, passed a long-term transportation infrastructure funding plan that allowed us to really take a holistic view of rehabilitating, building out our highway system and our local road network across the state. One of the things that we considered right from the start was, how could we not just put back the same asphalt and concrete, but approach rebuilding our infrastructure in a way that future-proofs it for decades to come? The I-70 corridor from Indianapolis to Columbus, Ohio is a huge freight corridor. Every truck in the U.S. is on this. At times, it looks like it's 100% trucks. They call Indiana the Crossroads of America. Welcome to Indiana, Crossroads of America. That's been the state's motto for more than 100 years, and we lead the nation in mileage of pass-through highways. You can reach 80% of the country within a day's drive. By virtue of our natural geographic location, we're a freight and logistics leader, but at the same time as we're seeing supply chains evolve. How do we support those truckers in the future? Anything that we can do as sort of a public-private partner to optimize our transportation network to help them better serve customers has positive benefits for all of us. We have a very unique ecosystem in Indiana with a top flight research university like Purdue. We are Purdue University, right? Where the difficult's done today and the impossible takes a bit longer. So we have plans next year to actually do a pilot project here in Indiana. We're gonna put down a quarter mile of this with the, with the chargers in it. Then we as a research team along with NDOT will have a year or two to do some different kinds of testing. I think their longer term plans would be to try to deploy one of these systems within maybe the next five to 10 years. It's my job to make sure we can get it in the pavement and the pavement is not gonna be the worst for it. And I was really kind of the first civil engineer, the first pavements person who actually showed up to these meetings and they had some really great dreams and I think I crashed their dreams to earth, asking them questions about like, how are you gonna put that in the pavement, right? We do maintenance on pavements. We periodically come through and mill uh, an inch or so off the surface of this and replace that. Well, if you put something in it, it's gotta be deeper than that. And if we run into it with our milling equipment, what's our milling equipment gonna do to your electronics? And rigid pavements, we have dowel bars, which are metal. And so now you're talking about setting up a magnetic field in the presence of metal dowels. 
We also have sometimes aggregates that have some metallic percent in them, but there were a lot of problems that they hadn't really thought through that, that, that we as civil engineers, pavement engineers kind of brought to them and said, you know, here's some things that maybe we want to think about. They said, oh, well, we didn't know that. Well, there you go. So this is the electrified pavement? It is. If I step on this, am I going to get all charged up? <laughs> no. Like if I walk across this, you could turn it on, there would be an electromagnetic field. Yes, we can turn it on and you can walk across it. It's no big deal. So they're right They're right in the middle. If you want, you. you can go over there and lie down and roll around on it. It won't hurt you or anything. <laughs> the electricity is driven into the wire and that creates the magnetic field that then is able to charge the vehicle's battery. When you run electricity through electrical wires, it generates heat. You know, if you heat a pavement up, that could be good in the wintertime, right? Oh yeah. In, in places where you have snow and ice especially. But the problem you have, especially with a flexible pavement, if it starts to get too hot, you can have problems with it. Can it's, move? It's, it's gonna wanna rud, it'll move around. Yeah, on. yeah. You know, my dad used to pour asphalt when I was a little really? baby, and now he's a trucker. So you know, he would be so excited to be here. Well, he knows the phrase then, I love the smell of asphalt in the morning. He does, and I don't think it's actually true <laughs> for him. <laughs> it is for me. Usually when we're testing, we're trying to fail something, and so, Typically, you can fail a pavement more easily if you run it in the same track all the time. Why do you want to fail? We don't learn anything. We don't fail anything, right? <laughs> it so, looks like a semi wheel. It is. It's half a semi axle. We load it to 9,000 pounds, half an axle, and it's dual tires and just the same thing you'd have on your semi tractor. And then you run it back and forth? So it actually runs off of an elevator motor. Do we fire this up? It's going to be noisy. I'm ready. Let's do it. I got to <laughs> okay. tell my dad about this. All right. These are unreinforced concrete pavements. I mean, there's no no steel in it. You guys are making her nervous. There it goes. <laughs> so I think that's just embarrassing. You sent someone out to interview me that jumps and runs. I'm ready. I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm here for it. <laughs> <laughs> Most people around the state associate NDOT with plowing snow, patching potholes, paving roads, building bridges. Uh, so when they learn that we're involved with leading edge transformational research like this, for a lot of folks that's surprising, but it's I think at the same time a point of pride that as we continue to pursue this project, we'll ultimately be able to sort of put together the playbook, if you will, for other uh, states and regions and countries to uh, emulate the same type of technology and deploy it on a larger scale in the future. We know looking at history that the best technologies are not always what's chosen and implemented. And that could be the case with what we're doing here, right? In a perfect world, everything would be electric, right? And we're, we're talking, you know, Star Wars kind of a thing, something way out into the future. And that's not necessarily true. I think that future is closer than we think it is. Not that we're going to be jetting around the galaxy anytime soon, but that we could have a lot of electric vehicles on the road very soon. But to get any new system into old infrastructure, that's going to require high reliability, long-term commitment, and a whole lot of cash. The question about what the business model will be is, is really complicated right now. Obviously, there's the public um, sector, the DOTs who own the, the, the infrastructure. There are utilities, and there has definitely to be a public-private partnership. The question that has to be asked from a sustainability standpoint is, where's all the electricity coming from? He's got a point. All those new electric vehicles, no matter where they charge, plugged in at home, at a fast charging station, or on an electrified roadway, they're going to need power. And reinforcing the grid with renewable energy will be a big part of future-proofing infrastructure across America. I think it's doable, by the way. I just think we need to ask those harder questions. Because there are a lot of people that are going to go through this, and if we don't set up the right infrastructure to make them successful, then we're going to have a lot of mechanics that are not going to know how to work on the right vehicles. We're going to have a lot of people that are losing their jobs in the petroleum industry, because those are going down, that there are gonna be plenty of jobs to work, but they're gonna need the right training. There are steps that we can take, whether it's a project like this or what's happening in the, the automotive manufacturing space and what's happening with transportation as a service and otherwise, all of those different evolutions can come together to have uh, really strong, tangible benefits as we look at sustainability long-term and environmental benefits and equity and accessibility. 
there's a lot happening and a lot of momentum around Indiana. And sometimes Hoosiers can be kind of humble and we don't always tell uh, that story. I, I guess I don't think about the cutting edge part of it. I just think there's a job to do and we're just doing that job, right? 